very much. So now Edwin is going to introduce our next speaker. Hi, my name is Edwin. My name is Edwin, and I'm an undergraduate at Queen Mary University of London. And it's a great honor to be part of this, taking part in the Dross Africa workshop with many of you scientists and researchers. You're, you've inspired all of us, and I'm sure most of the audience here are inspired today and will take it further, their future career as, as a scientist, researcher. And our next speaker is Sergio Casas, and he is from Spain. And his research topic is on glial neuron communication, which um, mediates neurodegeneration in, um, uh, sorry, glioblastoma. Sergio. Yes, can you hear me? Well, good morning, afternoon, good night. I don't know where you are, but uh, welcome everybody. Edwin, thank you very much. Are you on mute now? Asked to unmute, I've asked you. No, is that okay? Good. Okay. So uh, as many others, I would like to thank, of course, Isabel, Lola, Ross, Sofia, and all the organization of the Dros Africa. This is my second opportunity participating in this uh, meeting, one in person and one online. Hopefully next year, I will get to be one of the participants in person, but we never know. So I'm going to try to share my screen to uh, introduce you what we have been doing for, for some time. Uh, okay. Can you see it? Yes. Yes. Okay. That is great. So basically, we are interested in a human disease, which is called glioblastoma, which is a brain tumor. It's a tumor that uh, is originated in the brain from the glial cells, one of the types of the cells that live in the brain. But we do not study cancer. We study the impact of the brain tumor in the rest of the healthy brain. So we study neurodegeneration, but originated from a cancer situation. So this is a little bit different from what people usually do. Normally people do neurodegeneration from a neurodegenerative disease. We study neurodegeneration from the cancer, okay? So just to go straight to the idea, this is an image, a very uh, high magnification image of a drosophila brain where we have created a brain tumor, a glioblastoma. So the red or the magenta tissue is the tumor, is the glioma. And you can see how the glial cells, when they are a tumor, they organize these round structures around the neurons and how they communicate with the neurons to exchange messages that induce the growth of the tumor and the degeneration of the neurons. So and today we are going to go through some of these messages that create a neurodegenerative disease out of a tumor. So just a brief introduction. Well, so sorry, just a brief, in, brief introduction of the glioblastoma. This is the most aggressive primary brain tumor. Uh, and one of the most important features for us is that it is infiltrative. What does it mean? It means that the tumoral cells get no, into the... Sorry? Well, the tumoral cells go uh, into the brain. They infiltrate between the healthy cells and they uh, grow without uh, uh, without being possible to visualize them. So normally the glioblastoma, you can see this high density mass, which can be surgically removed, but also there is a lot of tumoral uh, tissue that has been growing through the brain and that causes uh, the relapse and at the end, the death of the patient. Uh, the, the survival of the patients is around 16 or 19 months, and most of the cases is caused by these infiltrative cells. So the question of the laboratory is how does the glioblastoma affect the neighboring cells? We know that after the surgical removal in the patients, they remove the solid part of the tumor, but still the patients, they have other neurological symptoms, such as fatigue, neurological symptoms, seizures, cognitive dysfunction, and many others. 
And all these characteristics resemble to what a neurodegenerative disease is. So we try to demonstrate that the glioma induces a neurodegeneration actually. So to do this, we use our friend Drosophila, which probably all of you know already, which is a great model system for this disease as it reproduces the most important features of the glioblastoma. So you probably know that uh, Drosophila has a very, very, very short life cycle of around 10, 12 days, which is great for us because we can have one generation every two weeks, which is very good. And today I am going to show you data using the brain of the larvae, which is the third insta larvae, which is already a completely uh, differentiated brain and is very useful for this type of experiments. So what do we do? In humans, the most frequent mutations are in EGFR, the epidermal growth factor receptor, and the PA3 kinase. And these are the signals that are triggered after these two mutations in humans and in the fly. So Rene Reed uh, uh, in the lab of John B. Thomas published this fantastic system to create a glioblastoma in Drosophila in 2009. And basically what they get is this is a normal Drosophila larva brain. And this is the brain of a larva when they induce this type of tumors. So in our interest was uh, the study and analysis of this, of this type of model. One of the first things that we saw was that they had a limitation in the locomotor activity. You can see on the left, the normal flies, and on the right, flies with the glioma of seven days. So after seven days of having the glioma in the adult flies, they already have a locomotion dysfunction, which is compatible with a degeneration of the nervous system. So we decided to go and study the neurons that might be controlling this uh, movement. We went to the neuromuscular junction, which is a very typical tissue to study neurodegeneration. Basically the soma of the neurons is in the brain, but they uh, send an axon that goes to the muscle and they do synapses with the muscle. So this is a larvae which is open and we can see the muscle, the, the body wall with the muscles. In a confocal magnification, we can see these yellow groups which are the neuromuscular junctions and these are stereotype uh, uh, neuromuscular junctions. So they always more or less have the same number of synapses that we can count one by one using some specific antibodies that will show you the active zones, the synapses in the synaptic buttons. So one of the first characteristics of a neurodegenerative process is that the neurons lose synapses. So if there is a reduction in the number of synapses, that is compatible with the idea of having a neurodegeneration. So the real images are this. This is a confocal image of a, a motor neuron in Drosophila. We can see the buttons. We can see in red, the membrane of the neuron and in green, the synapses. And we can see here on the bottom in blue, the glial tissue. As you can see here, the glia grows up to the point where the synapses begin. So they are not compatible one with the other. So what we did is using this system, we induce the expression of EGFR and PA3K in the glia, and we count the number of synapses. So this is a control sample on the top and on the bottom, this is a neuromuscular junction of an animal with a glioblastoma. As you can see, the morphology of the um, neuromuscular junction is disrupted. The number of boutons is reduced, but also if you count the number of synapses, there is a significant reduction of the synapse number in a model of glioblastoma. So we only change the expression of genes in the glial cells, but that has a consequence in the neurons. And the reduction in the number of synapses is not due to a reduction in the volume. The neurons are as big as in the controls, but they lose synapses. So we wanted to dig into the idea that maybe there is a signal that goes from the tumor to the neuron or, or the other way around to mediate this uh, uh, neurodegeneration. 
So in 2015, in using human samples in a mice, uh, uh, Frank Winkler and the group, a very big group in Germany, they described that in the glioblastoma samples in humans, they were able to observe some cellular projections here in green that are more and more dense as the tumor progresses. They, they say that the tumor produces some filaments, some protrusions, which they call tumor microtubes, which are phylopodia that go out from the tumor and they get into the brain. So with this idea in mind and reading some literature, we thought that maybe this was a system to communicate with the healthy tissue. I am not going to make this very long, but the tumor microtubes basically are uh, mediating the invasion, the proliferation, and the connection of a long distances, distances in the glioblastoma. They are used by the tumor cells to repair the, the glioma when they suffer any aggression. And they are comparable to what was described in Drosophila as cytonins. Cytonins are a type of phylopodia that were already described in Dros Drosophila in the epithelial cell. And they are very similar to the tumor microtubes. And the advantage is that we had a lot of tools to visualize the cytonins in Drosophila. So we wanted to use the tools to visualize cytonins in the glioblastoma cells to see if they were comparable. It is very important to note that in humans, the, the tumor microtubes were dependent on the expression of the gene GAP43, and this will be important later. So first we use a reporter of cytonins that is capable of marking only the cytonins in Drosophila. But instead of using this reporter in the epithelium, we use it in the brain. The reporter is called IHOP, RFP, so you can see it in red in these images. And if you pay attention on the top images, these are the controlled larval brains and the reporter is only expressed in the glial cells. And you can see the normal network of the glial cells. However, when we induce a glioblastoma in Drosophila, we see that the density of these cytonyms is significantly uh, higher. So they grow a lot, they send more uh, uh, protrusions, and they form this perineuronal nest, which were described in the humans in the late 70s. So if we go into detail of these structures, we stain for the neurons with the antibody HRP, and we saw that the glioma structures, that the glioma cytonyms were organizing surrounding groups of neurons that at the end were isolated. So as the tumor was growing, they were isolating groups of neurons that are right in the middle of all these structures. So the glioma cells build an organized network around the neurons with the glial cytonyms, okay? So we wanted to see this in detail. We use the electron microscopy images and you can see on the top, these are the control images. So in, in magenta, you can see the glia and in blue, you can see the neurons. And this is the normal organization of the tissue in the brain of the cells. But when we induce a glioblastoma, the glial cell becomes much bigger and they send this type of structures, this type of phylopodia that infiltrates through the brain. In occasions, we could see how the glial membranes were uh, enwrapping neurons, and we counted up to seven layers of tumoral membrane, of tumoral cytonyms around a neuron. So it was clear that the tumoral cells were organizing some structure around the neurons. As I told you before, to validate if this structure was comparable to what we have in humans, we knew that this structure, these are the controls on the top, the glioma in the middle, and this structure in humans is dependent on the expression of GAP43. So we knocked down GAP43 in the glioma and we observed that these tumors, even though they were genetically tumors, if they don't have GAP43, they cannot make this structure. On top of this, we observed that 
the glioma was generating a huge lethality that was prevented just if we knock down GAP43. So we could conclude that the inhibition of GAP43 was sufficient to restore the viability or to prevent the lethality in the glioma sum. So the question now was, what is this network for? What is the use of this glial network of cytonins or tumor microtubes? So it was known that in the cytonin, one of the molecules that is well uh, transported is wind, which in Drosophila is called wingless. So we study wingless in this uh, scenario. Wingless is a ligand that has some specific receptors one of the best studied families is the Fritzl family. So wingless binds to Fritzl, and then it creates a number of signals in the cell, which we are not going to go into detail. But at the end, armadillo, which is the beta catenin for mammalians, gets into the nuclei and signals. So the important players are the ligand wingless. The How much can... Sorry? Oh. The ligand wingless, the receptor Fritzl, and the effector, which is armadillo. But, well, we use an antibody to visualize wingless and we observe that in normal brains, this is distributed through all the brain in a more or less homogeneous manner. But when we create a glioma, you can see the membrane in this column here. And here is the distribution of wingless. Most of the protein was being accumulated in the membrane of the tumor. So this was a ligand, but if there is a ligand, there has to be a receptor, Fritzl. So we also stain for the receptor. And similar to the ligand, in a normal brain, in a controlled brain, the receptor is distributed through all the brain. But it is accumulated in the structures that surround the neurons in the glioma samples. If we use an RNAi against Fritzl, we do not see it, but still, the network is formed, so the network of the tumor does not require Fritzl to be formed. And if we knock down GAP43, we don't have a network, but we don't have a particular distribution of Fritzl. So Fritzl distribution or Fritzl accumulation depends on the formation of the network. Again, the viability of the animals, which is uh, dramatically reduced when we generate a, a glioma, the viability can be rescued when we knock down the receptor, indicating that Fritzl receptor and probably the pathway plays an important role in the lethality induced by the glioma. Okay, but that we have a receptor, we have a ligand, but the we have to know if the tumoral cells and the neurons physically interact to answer to the original question, how do these cells communicate? So first of all, to determine if these cells interact, we use the GRASP uh, uh, in a glia neuron uh, scenario. GRASP is basically the reconstitution of a green fluorescent protein. We put half of the fluorescent protein in the glia, and we express the other half in the neuron. Only if these two cells touch each other at a very close synaptic distance, they will reconstitute GFP and we will see a signal. So when we do these experiments, we can observe the control samples on the left at three different magnifications and the experimental glioma on the right. And we are going to pay attention only to this line because it's easier, sorry. And we can see how this is the reconstitution of the grasp in a normal brain. There is some signal. You can see here on the bottom, there are some cells that have a contact of the glia and the neuron. But when we create a glioma, this contact is massive. So it is clear that there is an enhancement of the interaction between the glial cell and the neuron when we uh, induce a glioma. Okay, the two cells touch each other but that doesn't mean that Fritzl and Wingless are interacting in this scenario. So we did another experiment, which is called PLA, proximity ligation assay, which very shortly, it is based on the interaction of two proteins. We put an antibody in Fritzl, an antibody in Wingless, and when they get together, we can do a PCR, so a fluorescent PCR. 
if there is a signal in the PCR, that means that the two proteins are together. So this experiment was very clear in the control samples. Each of these dots in the PLA that you can see here is one physical interaction of a receptor and a ligand. And on the bottom, you can see the number of interactions of the Fritzl receptor and wingless ligand in a glioma. When we quantify this, it was very clear that we have, we have five times more uh, interaction of the receptor and the ligand in a glioma scenario. If this is true, there has to be a signal inside of the cell. So we decided to use all the battery of reporters that report for the wingless pathway. So we use five reporters and some antibodies. In all cases, we could see how in the glioma, there is more signal for the wingless pathway than in the control. And in all cases, when we knock down the network, this wind signaling goes back to a normal situation. So it is clear that the glioma is using a phyloporia that we can call tumor microtubes or cytonin to touch the neuron and then induce the signaling of the wingless pathway. So once we know this, what, is this important? Is this relevant for the tumor or is this relevant for the neuron? So first we decided to, to study what happens to the glioma cells, to the tumor. We counted the number of glial cells. You can see here the control, the glioma, the glioma without the receptor Fritzl and the glioma without GAP43, so without the network. And when we quantify this, we observe that there is always an increase in the number of glial cells in a glioma and always the number of cells, the, the increase in the number of cells is prevented if we knock down the receptor or if we knock down GAP43. So the network and wind signalings are required for the glial cell to proliferate in a tumoral condition. So, so far we had this type of model. There is a glioma cell that is going to send some protrusions, some tumor microtubes that will interact with the neuron and then they will accumulate the receptor Fritzl that we propose will help to take the ligand from the neuron. That was the working hypothesis. This will stimulate the proliferation of the tumor and that will be in theory in, in our pro proposal, the responsible of the neurodegeneration. We have to demonstrate this. If this is true, that the mm, receptor Fritzl is mediating the depletion of uh, wingless, we call it vampirization. If Fritzl is mediating the vampirization of, of wingless, and then we can put some extra receptor in the neuron, they should compete. And if that is true, that would be sufficient to stop the proliferation of the tumor. So we wanted to do a competition for the cell-to-cell -cell communication with the, among, between the glioma and the neuron. So we did a genetic strategy where we create the glioma and on top of that, we put extra receptors in the neuron. And when we observe the results, this is the size of one lobe of the brain in a glioma sample. And this is the same glioma sample, but now the neurons have extra Fritzl receptor. As you can see, the size is uh, much smaller, is restored to a normal condition. So the tumor does not grow if the neuron can compete for wingless. This was one of the conclusions of the study in the cell-to-cell -cell communication. But what happens to the neuron in all this story? Because we have been studying the tumor, but what about the neuron? Okay, we, we go back to the neuromuscular junction as a system to count synapses. And we could observe in the quantifications, we count the number of signal here, the spots, we know that in the glioma, there is a significant reduction in the number of synapses, so a neurodegeneration. But when we put extra receptor in the neuron, we can prevent the loss of synapses. So the neuron only needs extra receptor 
to stop the tumor and to block the neurodegeneration. So it is clear that the communication, the competition for some ligands between the tumor and the neuron is important. In addition- uh, Sorry, Dr. Sergio, um, I think we're running out of time. Just okay. run, up. Um, run up. Yeah. Are there any like questions from the audience? No, no, he can finish. You, you can finish it, sorry. Yes. Give me a couple of minutes, <laughs> a couple of minutes. Okay. Of course, of course. So I, 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 will, I will go very fast. So um, the number of synapses when we knock down the receptor in the tumor is also uh, restored. When we don't have the network is restored. And if we stimulate the signal with armadillo, but we also remove the receptor, then we have a full tumor with the full signaling. But as the tumor does not have the receptor, also they can rescue the neurodegeneration. So um, the idea of all this is okay. The proposal is that the tumor is taking wingless from the neuron. We wanted to see first, maybe wingless is coming from the tumor. We, we had to discard or not this possibility. So we created a glioma, but we knocked down the expression of wingless in the tumor in this C line. And as you can see here, the tumor has the same number of cells with or without wingless and the size of the, uh, of the volume of the tumor is, this, is the same. So we know that wingless is not coming from the tumor. It has to come from the neuron. So we did one last experiment and then we will go for the questions is, okay, the proposal is that wingless is coming from the neuron. What if we create a glioblastoma in a fly that has wingless anchored to the membrane so that it cannot be uh, uh, depleted from the membrane? We use a particular tool, which is called uh, wingless NRT, that this is anchored to the membrane of the neuron. And we observe that when the tumor has in front of the tumor a neuron with wingless anchor to the membrane, they cannot grow. So at this point, the current model that we are working with is that the communication between the glia and the neuron is very important. In particular, PA3K and EGFR, we trigger in the glia the remodeling of the cytoskeleton and the production of the tumor microtubes, the, the cytonins. These cytonins will mediate the signaling of wingless in the tumor, but also a reduction of the signal in the neuron. I didn't have time to go through this, but wingless signaling will trigger Gen K, will trigger the production of um, MMPs that will uh, digest the extracellular matrix so more tumor microtubes can infiltrate in the brain. And at the end, one of the important parts of all of this is that the neurons degenerate due to this competition for the ligands. And then therefore the communication between the two cells is very relevant for the, um, for the progression of the tumor. Sure. So with this, I will finish. I'm going to jump all this out because we don't have time to do this, but this is very important. Here it is. If it gets to the last one, please. This one, this is the most important of all. I have a team of very smart people and I would like to thank all of them. I would like to thank the Dross Africa for this opportunity. And of course the funding agencies that they put the money so that we can do this. So I will be happy to take any question from you and thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sergio. Um, um, Amos, can you explain what you mean by um, the CNS comments you just left? Dr. Okay. Amos? Uh, thank you very much. Um, it's a great talk. So we enjoyed everything. So we just want to know if glioma actually performs a similar function, either to uh, the astrocytes, microglia, or the oligodendrocytes equivalent in mice. So that when we are designing experiments, we know where to focus on, mm -hmm. especially with respect to neuron glioma interaction. Yes. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your question. Um, the glioblastoma has been classified for many years, depending on the cell of origin. And it was proposed that the glioblastoma was being originated from astrocytes, from oligodendrocytes, or maybe from neural precursors. In 2016, the, the World Health Organization decided that it was more accurate to classify the glioblastomas uh, uh, by the mutations. So in this case, we generate the glioblastoma uh, based on EGFR and PA3K, which has the most common mutations. And in my experience, it doesn't matter the cell of origin, if it is an oligodendrocyte or if it is an astrocyte. At the end, you have a similar relation of the glioblastoma cell and the neuron. And the communication of these two cells is similar, no matter which is the cell of origin of the glioblastoma. Thank you. Thank you. And our next question from uh, Helen. Can you confirm if etiology of dementia can be explained by your experimental data? I, I, I would love to, and I can confirm it in Drosophila and in mice, but not in humans. In Drosophila, we have ob observed a and in mice a deficit of learning and memory, anxiety, and other features that are typically associated to the dementia but not in humans. In humans, it has been observed that there is a death of neurons next to the tumor. So everything indicates that probably one of the main causes of dementia in the glioblastoma patients is the neurodegeneration caused by maybe this uh, communication. In vitro, we, in, in human cells in vitro, we have observed something similar. If we co-cultivate a glioblastoma and neurons, the neurons suffer from a loss of signals that will trigger the degeneration of the neurons in vitro. But still, in human patients, I cannot confirm that yet, but I would bet that it has to be like that. Thank you. And from Pooja, um, we have where this NC82 is expressed, not understanding active zones. Is it present inside the bouton? Button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the NC82 is the antibody. Uh, it recognizes a protein which is called Bruch pilot, which is a cast protein also conserved in humans and in mammals. And this is one of the proteins that uh, is put in the presynaptic zone once it is mature. So the presynapsis is called active zone, and then they you can count the number of active zones, which are the presynaptic zone, and then consider that those are synapses. So NC82 is the antibody that recognizes Bruch pilot. And this is a very useful antibody, very cheap, and that is sold in the Hybridoma Center. It's very good, very cheap, and very useful to study neurodegeneration. Okay, um, thank you very much, Sergio, 